So welcome everyone to our service this morning. And uh, if you've been watching the slides, you know what's going on. And you can always tell it's Siobhan on the slides with uh, the upbeat praise. So thank you, Siobhan. So, so let's pray. Lord, we love to meditate on the words of Psalm 139. Lord our God, you know each one of us intimately. And may we say with the psalmist, search me, O God, and know my heart, my anxious thoughts survey. Show me what gives offence to you and lead me in your way. So we come today, Lord, asking you to search our hearts, to show us what you see in us. Lord, save us from ourselves, save us from the subjects that we'll be covering today, Lord, save us from hypocrisy, save us from fearing man and not fearing God, save us from being people pleasers, save us from focusing on ourselves and not on others. May we indeed love our neighbor as we would love ourselves. May we love even those who hate us and speak badly of us. May we forgive others as you, O Lord, have forgiven us. So today, Lord, we come giving thanks for the funeral service yesterday of the Duke of Edinburgh. We thank you, Lord, that your word was central in the praise and in, in the whole service, Lord. We thank you that he chose the psalms and the singings and the readings. And we pray especially for our Queen today as she mourns his passing. Lord, we pray for all who mourn today. We thank you that your word is a real comfort uh, and your word can bring peace. So we again remember uh, our friend Marianne and pray for her and her family at this sad time. And Lord, we would commit today to the many still suffering throughout this world because of this disease, this pandemic. Lord, we remember desperate situations that are relayed to us from our friends in India and in South America and in other places too. Lord, would you bless and protect and would you save? And Lord, we thank you for the efforts that your people are making to help others. Be with us as a congregation as we would seek guidance and wisdom in the different situations that we face. Lord, uh, that we would know your ways and that you would know your will. Lord, would you not again revive your church here in Scotland and throughout the world? We think of Psalm 85, will you not again revive us so that we may rejoice in you? Show us, Lord, your covenant mercy, your salvation grant in you. So bless your word preached today throughout the world, Lord. Bless it and may it bring people to yourself. Uh, we thank you, Lord, that your word never returns to your void or empty. It's your word that brings life and light. Dispel falsehood, expose liars, support the poor and under, underprivileged in society. Be with the lonely, Lord, and the unloved, the, the sick and the sad. Lord, enable us to bring this gospel to our generation. May we see this generation one for our King Jesus. Be with our political leaders. Lord, as we hear of one manifesto being uh, announced after another, we thank you, Lord, for your manifesto, your word that is based on truth and integrity, on justice and on mercy. So bless all people, Lord, today. Bless our young, bless our children, bless those coming to an end of their lives, Lord. May they be trusting in you, even those drawing their last breath today, Lord, we take comfort from the thief on the cross who said, remember me to the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And he heard the response, today you will be with me in paradise. So let your light shine, Lord, amidst the darkness of death and disease. And we ask all things in the precious and powerful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So we're coming to our craft, and uh, as you know, we've been going through all the biblical characters, uh, starting with A, right through now to X, and uh, I'm not sure if 
you can think of anyone in the Bible whose name begins with X, but um, I know of at least one, so I'm hoping my guess was right. Well, actually, I know my guess was right. So James will reveal all. Who is X today? Well, X is for Xerxes. And uh, it looks as if to me that Xerxes is a prince or a king. And he's there with a queen or a princess. But I'm sure the children will tell us the story connected with Xerxes in the Bible. Well, let's hear what God's got to say to us today as we read uh, from his word in the gospel according to Luke chapter 12. And we're reading verses 1 to 12. So it's Luke 12, uh, 1 to 12. And Nikki's going to read for us this morning. In the meantime... When so many thousands of people had gathered together that they were trampling one another, he began to say to his disciples first, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Nothing is covered up that will not be revealed, or hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light. And whatever you have whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed on the housetops. I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body and after that have nothing more that they can do. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear him who after has, he has killed has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And not one of them is forgotten before God. Why, even the hairs of your head are unnumbered, are all numbered. Fear not, you are more of more value than many sparrows. And I tell you, Everyone who acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man, will acknowledge before the angels of God. But the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. And when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Nikki. So we see the importance of the Holy Spirit there in our reading, and uh, we pray that the Holy Spirit will be with us in the days ahead, and also now as we meet together. So we praise God where two or three are gathered in his name, he is with us, and uh, we pray his blessing now as he convicts us, as he maybe converts some of us today, as we turn to this uh, portion of scripture that we read together, Luke chapter 12 and verses 1 to 12. Now, as recorded in the previous chapter in Luke's Gospel, following on from his teaching on prayer, Jesus had been accused by the Pharisees of casting out demons by the power of Satan. They could not deny the reality of the miracles, but they failed to see that they were from God, attributing them instead to Beelzebub, the prince of demons. And Jesus had strongly rebuked them, saying in Luke eleven twenty, If it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come against you. And later, whoever is not with me is against me. And the chapter ends with Jesus proclaiming a series of woes in judgment against the scribes and the Pharisees, accusing them of hypocrisy. And we'll con continue this theme in our study today. We'll look at this under three headings, hypocrisy, hell, and thirdly, Holy Spirit. But first of all, hypocrisy. 
So Jesus moved on uh, once more, and again, once more, the crowds uh, gathered around him. We read right at the beginning of Luke 12, so many thousands of the people had gathered together that they were trampling over another, one another. And Jesus addressing his disciples, but also in the hearing of those around, warned, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Now, the people were well aware of leaven or, or yeast used in the baking of bread. And when the leaven was first added, it appeared to make little difference at all, but gradually it would spread through the whole dough. So like yeast in bread, hypocrisy is undetectable initially, but in time, its influence is apparent. As the yeast ferments the batch of dough, so hypocrisy affects society can even affect church, can affect different situations. In fact, it has a negative effect on everyone it touches. Earlier, a Pharisee, in inviting him to dine at his house, had been astonished that Jesus had not washed before eating. But Jesus said to him, 1139, you Pharisees clean the outside of the cups and dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. The Pharisees looked good, and they sounded good, appearing holy and righteous, but Jesus knew that they were not right before God. The Bible says man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. So following on from this, Jesus had condemn, condemned them, saying again in Luke 11.42, woe to you Pharisees, because you give a tenth of your garden herbs, but you neglect justice and the love of God. Woe to you Pharisees, because you love the most important seats in the synagogues. Woe to you, because you are like unmarked graves, which people walk over without knowing it. You are like unmarked graves which people walk over without knowing it. So what did Jesus mean here? Well, according to the law, Jews were made unclean by coming in contact with graves. But if that grave was unmarked, uh, unmarked they would become unclean without knowing it. In a similar way, the people were in danger of becoming unclean in the sight of God through the silent, destructive hypocrisy of the Pharisees. Hypocrites are people who wear masks, who pretend to be what they are not, who claim to have certain standards but fail to live up to them. The Pharisees were taken up with image. They practiced their religion to be seen by men, but they were insincere. They were faking it. Jesus warned his disciples in Matthew 6, when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. And God would expose their hypocrisy. Here Jesus declared in verse 2, nothing is covered up that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light, and what you have whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed on the housetops. And even in this present day with data protection and revealing uh, information, we, we can find out what people have said uh, about us in the dark or privately. The Bible says, be sure your sins will find you out. So these teachers of religion were superficial in their faith. And as a result of this, they were also leading others astray. And we read of other woes from the lips of Jesus in Matthew 23. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those who are trying to. 
and later, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. So this warning was first and foremost aimed at the disciples of Jesus. And those of us today who are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ need to question ourselves regarding this teaching. Are we attempting to impress people by leading churchy religious lives? Or are we genuine believers set on pleasing God, following his word and following his way? But the warning was also for the crowd that had gathered. The Lord sees hearts. He knows the truth. We were singing in Psalm 139, O Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. So will you bow before him today? Will you confess your sin to Jesus and accept him as Lord over your life? Will you Make it your heart's ambition to please God rather than to please men. Will you live life out to the full, your faith to the full, so people will know that you are a follower of Jesus? If you were convicted today of being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you of that? So that's our first heading, hypocrisy. Our second heading is hell, and Jesus mentions hell in our passage today. To, throughout the world today, Christians are persecuted for their faith, even unto death. And here Jesus encouraged his disciples to take courage. He says there in verse 4, I tell you, my friends, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body and after have nothing more they can do. Ultimately, it's not the body that matters, but the eternal soul. The body will die. From dust you came, and to dust you will return. But the soul lives on. The Bible says, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? One of the readings yesterday at the funeral of the Duke of Edinburgh spoke of taking nothing into the world and taking nothing away with us at the end of it. But the soul is so important. At death, the soul of believers pass into the paradise of God immediately. Therefore, do not fear what mortal man can do, as the psalmist says. But fear God, who alone has the power to cast into hell. Jesus said here in verse 5, I will warn you whom to fear. Fear him who, after he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. The second warning then is aimed at his friends. Jesus was teaching them the importance of remaining faithful to and focused on God, to seek heaven and to actively avoid hell. And the word used here is not Hades, but Gehenna, the ever-burning fire, the place prepared for the devil and his angels. Not prepared for us, but for the devil and his angels, but the devil is hell-bent to take us with him there. He is a liar, and he will try everything to convince us and to convict us to follow his lies. But that is the place of eternal separation from God. The Bible says that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. This is a fear born of reverence and awe for God, an awareness of God's goodness, an awareness of God's power and majesty. So it's fear of God, 
versus fear of man. And we often worry about offending people. How much more should we be concerned about offending God? So will you today honor God? Will you revere him and worship him? He loves you and he cares for you. Here Jesus continued, Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And not one of them is forgotten before God. At this time, sparrows were the food of the poor. As far as society was concerned, they were of little value, but not to God. We read the words of Jesus in Matthew's account, Matthew 10. Not a single sparrow falls to the ground without your father knowing it. And here Jesus said, why, even the hairs of your head are numbered, are all numbered. Fear not, you are of more value than many sparrows. Fear not, paradoxically, it's those who fear God who do not need to fear. Don't need to fear anything because God protects his people. If he cares for a little sparrow, he cares for you. We were made in the image of God. The Bible tells us that. So, friend, are you getting what God is saying here? Is the Holy Spirit speaking to you? You are of more value to God than you can ever realize. What does it profit a man if he gains a whole world and loses his soul? You can be the richest person with all the money and all the diamonds in the world, but without Christ, you perish. Your soul is more of, of more value to God than all the diamond and golds in the gold in this world. And he cares for all of his creation. He knows you. He knows even the hairs on your head. They're all numbered before him today. You are important to God. He cared enough to send Jesus to save you. So will you trust in Jesus today? Will you openly acknowledge your faith in him? Here, Jesus, the son of God, the son of man, made this amazing promise. Verse 8, I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men, that's here now in this world, everyone who acknowledges me before men, the son of man will acknowledge before the angels of God. Isn't that amazing? How marvelous, how wonderful that Jesus would speak on our behalf, on your behalf, before the angels of God. What a savior. What an advocate. Be encouraged today to commit your life to serving Jesus Christ. We think of Paul's encouragement to Timothy, the word of God, which God moved by his spirit, and men wrote what God wanted them to write. And this is what Paul writes. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about the Lord. Can you say, will you say with the Apostle Paul, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is a power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. But, but if you deny him and refuse to repent of your sin, then Jesus will deny you. For he also says, verse 9, the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. He says again in Mark's gospel, Mark 8, for whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him will the son of man also be ashamed when he comes in his glory the glory of his father with the holy angels again second timothy if we deny him he will also deny us 1 john chapter 2 no one who denies the son has a father whoever confesses the son has a father also so, if this verse speaks to you today, then don't be discouraged, for you are still on mercy's ground. Think of Peter himself, 
who heard these very words from the lips of Jesus, and yet he went and denied the Lord three times because of the fear of man. Well, actually, the fear of a little servant girl. But Peter repented of that sin. He wept tears of repentance from his heart, and Jesus had mercy on him. Peter was restored, and more for later, having been empowered by the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, he would declare his Lord and the love of the Lord with boldness. That, my friend, is what God can do, and that's what God still does. Jesus himself said, verse 10, everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. And we've just had an example of that in Peter and in our own lives. Maybe we've denied him for a while, but then we came to that point of confessing him. Everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But here's another but. But the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. So what does Jesus mean? Well, let's turn then to our third heading, Holy Spirit. Matthew 12, 31. Therefore I tell you, says Jesus, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven either in this age or in the age to come. So the Holy Spirit then is the third person of the Trinity. He came in power upon Jesus at his baptism. Jesus was led by the Spirit, remember, into the wilderness. Then Jesus returned in the power of Spirit to Galilee. His ministry was carried out in cooperation with the Holy Spirit, so it was when the Pharisees accused Jesus of casting out demons by the power of Beelzebub, they were guilty of blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. Now, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is not just a one-off offense, but a continuing, ongoing attitude of rebellion a stubborn way of life that continually resists, rejects, hurts, and insults the Holy Spirit. It is a deliberate act of rebellion, a rejection of all that is of God. As the first martyr, Stephen was stoned to death for his faith. Remember what he cried out, Act 751, you stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. That's what he said. You always resist the Holy Spirit. If today you sense the Holy Spirit striving with you, if today you sense Jesus calling you to a new way of life, don't resist, but repent. Of your sins. For God said, My spirit will not always strive with man. Don't presume there'll be a tomorrow. Don't presume that the Lord will keep prompting and prodding you, that you'll put off the day of salvation. Tomorrow isn't promised. The opportunity to trust in Jesus may soon pass. But come to him now, while there is yet time. Today is the day of salvation. Psalm 95 tells us, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. So when you come to trust in Jesus for salvation, when you come to fear God, you will no longer fear man. For the Holy Spirit himself will be your strong defense. Jesus said here in verse 11, and we have these words up on our slides, and when they bring you, before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities. Do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you 
in that very hour what you ought to say. So Jesus spoke these words to his disciples, remember, who later would be taken before rulers and authorities. We think of Peter, who along with John uh, stood against the same religious authorities from whom they had earlier fled when Jesus had been arrested. But then one day they would stand before these rulers and authorities, these very same people, the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling council, who had condemned Jesus to death. By this time, the apostles were empowered by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit enabled them to speak with authority. They declared there in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, there is salvation and no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now, when the people saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. And they recognized, they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Again, Acts chapter 4, the council charged them not to speak or to teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. They could not be silenced because the fear of the Lord had fallen upon them. As Christians, we take comfort from these words today, these words from the very lips of our Lord and Saviour. Do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. And we think of the words in Philippians chapter 3, do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So, friend, today, whatever anxiety you face today, and maybe many anxieties, many worries, with many concerns, many cares, Cast them upon the Lord your God. Cast them upon Jesus who tells us that he can take our burdens and our cares and our concerns. And when you do that, you experience the comfort of the Holy Spirit. And you will experience the peace of God that passes all understanding. And remember what Jesus said, John 14, if you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Friends, the Holy Spirit is in you. The third person of the Trinity comes to dwell in us when we come and commit to Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. He directs us and he tells us what to say. So the disciples would face severe persecution, even death on account of their Lord, but they counted him worthy he is worthy of all blessing and praise and glory. Friends, today, give him all your praise and all your adoration. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that you are indeed worthy of all honor and praise and glory. Still us, Lord, before you, may we not be anxious. There is so much going on around us and in us, Lord. But may we cast all our burdens upon you today because you see the inside and the out. You know even the hairs on our head. 
and you're aware of every little sparrow that falls to the ground. May we come and commit to you then, Lord, as our Maker and our Saviour. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.